I'm Patrick Daly and welcome to Interlinks. Interlinks is a programme about globalisation and the effects it has had on other countries around the world over the last 50 years or so. In each programme, we interview a person from another country or with strong connections to another country to get their unique perspective on globalisation as it has affected them, their country and its relationship with Ireland and the wider world. There's a little bit of history, a dash of economics, a sprinkling of business and an overlay of personal experience from both me and from my interviewees from around the world. In recent programmes, we have jumped back and forth across the Atlantic, from Croatia to Mexico, from Spain to the USA, and then back again to Poland. Today, we are staying in Europe and heading right to the heart of the continent, to the largest economy in Europe, Angela Merkel's Germany. More precisely, we're heading to Munich, the capital of the largest and richest state or land in Germany, Bavaria. Munich is world famous for its beer festival, the Oktoberfest, and as the HQ of iconic German consumer and industrial brands such as BMW, Siemens, Audi, Allianz, Adidas, Puma, Osram, Lindy and Mann, among others, as well as being the home of the celebrated Bayern Munich football club of Franz Beckenbauer, Gerd Müller, Uli Hoeneß, Karl-Heinz Rummenigge, Philipp Lahm, Schweinsteiger, Klose, Klinsmann and so many more. Munich today is a vibrant, wealthy, pulsating business and economic hub in the heart of Europe. With over 37% of its population of non-German background, Munich is a truly global city and today we will be talking to one of those non-German residents of Munich. My guest today is an Englishman with a very Scottish name, a German wife and three German-born children who has been resident in Munich for over 15 years. Today we will be talking to Hamish McKenzie, founder and chief consultant of his own specialised business consultancy, working with international clients in the tech sector, helping them to identify and deliver pragmatic solutions that bring value to their own customers that is unique and that enables them to grow their businesses much more rapidly than they would otherwise be possible without Hamish's help. I was introduced to Hamish McKenzie through a mutual acquaintance in California earlier this year. And even in our initial emails and Skype calls, we found that we got on very well and had quite a lot in common. Later, while Hamish was on a very short stopover in Dublin on his way back to Munich from Boston, I collected him at the airport and he and I popped down to Krabby Joe's in Hoth Harbour for a bit of breakfast and a chinwag before rushing him back to the airport for his onward journey to Munich. Over breakfast, I found, and I know you will too, that Hamish is a gentleman and a scholar and he may well also be a judge of fine whisky. And I'm looking forward very much to talking to him again today. Delighted to welcome Hamish McKenzie on the line from Munich in Germany. Welcome, Hamish, and thank you very much for being here with us today. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, thanks. Delighted to be here. Delighted to be speaking to you again. Yeah, it's great. It's great to talk to you again. So, Hamish, you're in uh, Munich, and Munich's name is very well known because of the beer festival and the football club and so on. But its precise location may not be familiar to all. Could you situate Munich for us on the map, where it is, how big it is, what it's like in terms of its climate and environment, main economic activities, and what it's like as a place to live, to work and, and to play? Yeah, sure. So, so um, yeah, Munich is in the southeast corner of the country. Um, it's the second or third, third largest city in Germany, I believe, um, and it's growing pretty fast. Uh, when I arrived uh, about 16 years ago now, it was around 1.2 million people. I think it's around 1.5 now, uh, and they're forecasting that that's going to go up to around 1.8 uh, in the next five years. So, so it's growing pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've got proper seasons, uh, which um, certainly compared to com- compared to where I grew up in England, uh, is a much bigger um, range of temperatures. Um, it can get down to minus 20 or minus 30 in the winter. Can get up to about plus forty uh, degrees Celsius in the summer. I mean, those are extremes. Yeah, yeah. But but it's it's definitely kind of a fifty degree span. Um, we're about five hundred meters above sea level, so we do usually get some snow in the winter, um, and we're about um, forty minutes away from the mountains. Um, so just a, literally three quarters of an hour in a car, and you and you can be up a mountain, uh, kind of a thousand meters, fifteen hundred meters plus. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's some good skiing in the winter. Um, and, and the other great thing about Munich, from my perspective, um, is that it's, it's I mean, <laughs> I love it here, but, but it's also fantastic, uh, fantastically situated for other countries. Um, so we're, we're pretty, we're very close to the, the Austrian border, Czech Republic, uh, Italy, Switzerland, you can get to all these places within 
a couple of hours driving time. Um, it's also incredibly safe, um, very, very low crime rates. Um, and it's just gen generally a very pleasant, pleasant environment, pleasant place to live, a uh, great place to bring up a family. Um, I mean, what it's not, if you compare it to somewhere like Berlin, then it, I wouldn't say it's really like a, a buzzing party city like Berlin can be. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's just a very pleasant place to live. It's, it's quite conservative. Um, uh, and it's becoming more and more international. Yeah. Um, that's perhaps yeah. another good point to make. I think um, I read somewhere on a World Quality of Life Index or a European Quality of Life Index. It was yeah. ranked top or very near the top. Is that right? Um, I think I, I've, I've seen that as well. Um, the only the only city that I know that comes regularly above Munich globally is, is Vancouver. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I think there are actually quite a lot of parallels to be drawn between the two places. Um, I mean, I think Vancouver's probably got a few more uh, crime problems uh, in, the, in the last few years. But but you know, in terms of the mountain environment, um, big outdoors aspect to life. Um, a good business hub, um, very attractive place to live. There, there are definitely similarities there. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think Munich is, is is pretty regularly up in up in the top three or four places in those in those kind of surveys. Yeah, it sounds sounds wonderful. And uh, I'm I'm actually going over in February, so really looking forward to it. Um, so you've been there for I think you just mentioned in that answer 16 years, yeah. uh, living and working in Munich. And how did you actually come to settle there in the first place and build build a life there? <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the, the classic story. Uh, I met a, a German woman in London okay. uh, in my in my early thirties, uh, and I, I actually arrived here on on, on my thirtieth birthday in two thousand two. Um, uh, so anyway, yeah, we we were working in, in the same company, and and she was keen to come back to Germany, um, and and I just decided to go with her. Uh, I, I would be lying if I said that you know Germany had always been my my dream destination, <laughs> but. Um, but, but I decided, I, I had also felt for a while that I needed to leave the UK if I was going to really um, do something, uh, you know, a bit, a bit less a bit less ordinary maybe than than, sure. than, uh, than otherwise might have been the case. So, so, yeah, that's how I ended up here. Yeah, I, I think you, you had probably been thinking about somewhere else. Um, yes, that's right. I think I mentioned to you last time we saw each other, my original plan was to go to Canada because uh, actually Vancouver, which I just mentioned. Yeah. And because I've got family out there, so um, that that was my original plan. Um, okay. But as it's turned out, uh, Munich turned out to be a pretty good second choice. Okay, so you arrive in in Munich um, fifteen, sixteen years ago uh, with your girlfriend now now wife, yeah. and you started to to make a life and to work there. So, what did you find that you had to adjust to as as a Brit, if you like, living in in Germany? What kind of things were were different? Well, um, I mean, obviously, first of all, the language. Uh, maybe we can speak about, a bit about that later. But um, so that that was the first problem. Um, I, I didn't have a job. I couldn't speak the language. Um, so that those those are those big big challenges. Um, I guess that the first thing that that struck me was was how direct people are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the locals can often come across. If you're not used to it, they can come often come across as as quite rude. Um, but they usually they're not actually meaning to be rude. They're just um, uh, yeah, it's just their way. So, like, you can ask for directions, and it, it's like they're <laughs> it's like they're telling you off when they give you an answer. But um, <laughs> so they're a bit abrupt. Uh, the service, the service in restaurants and, and shops can also be a bit like that. Um, so that that was uh, that was definitely different. Um, the bureaucracy, uh, you know, Germany. I think European countries in general have a have a reputation for being quite bureaucratic, uh, and I think that's there's definitely there's truth to that. There are a lot of jobs worth. Um, in in the public sector positions as well. So when you, when you're applying to to get your um, you know approval for residency or, or whatever it may happen to be, and there's a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of red tape. Mm -hmm. and so uh, and then once you actually start working, then you you realise uh, at least you're, if you're an employee, you realise that you have a lot less in your pay packet than you did, uh, you know pr proportionately than you might have done if had you were you, if you were used to being in the UK or I'm not sure what it's like in Ireland, but um. So yeah, the taxes the taxes are definitely a bit higher, um, but I would argue that that you see that in terms of the quality of uh, in terms of the quality of a lot of the public services, um, you know, 
there is a difference to be noticed there as well. A bit of return on, on the on the more on the extra tax that you're paying. And then, when looking to get a job or to do business with uh, Germans, is it a misconception that maybe in working business they attach a lot more importance to formal qualifications and credentials than maybe would be the norm for us in the English speaking world? Is that, is that right? And has it impacted you in any way? Um, it, it's certainly not a misconception. It's definitely true. Uh, I, th- I think it is changing slightly. Um, but uh, a lot of a lot of people do spend an awful lot of time trying to get as many letters after their name as possible, um, and in the middle classes in particular, a master's degree is kind of seen as the you know the minimum mm. requirement, um, and uh, you know a lot of people seem to think that if you if you're a doctor of something, then you have some kind of I don't know magical powers or something. It, it, you know, people <laughs> are automatically held in in much higher esteem if they have a doctorate. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if that doctorate turns out to be in something like I don't know um, film studies or or yeah something along those lines, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're you know that they're, they're some kind of business guru guru or whatever. Um, so that's definitely still true. Um, the other thing is um, that I've learned uh, since being self-employed here, um, pe- people tend to either work for a big company or they have their own company with you know 20 50 100 employees and if you if you're neither of those those things like like me I'm a I'm a I'm an independent consultant one person business um, and people tend to look at that <laughs> with a with a slight bit of suspicion sometimes um, I think it's improving you know because the you know Germany is not immune from the way uh, the, the, the global economy is moving um, and it's becoming a lot more common um, to, to be working on your own but uh, but no that that definitely is still the case um, and P- Germans take a lot of reassurance from the fact that you know they're they're dealing with a very well well qualified person which is you know. It's fair enough, I guess, but sure. it is not necessarily a guarantee of quality. Of course. So then, coming back to the language, particularly in the early years, I, I know from experience because I, I, you know, I've tried to learn uh, German a few times, and the grammar is is tough as hell, and a lot of the vocabulary is totally unrecognisable to to an English speaker. So, how did you get on top of that? Did, did you go to formal classes, and how long did it take you to get to a level of fluency where you could live and work at ease with the language? Yeah. Um well, to be honest, it was it was pretty much classic uh, learning by doing. Um, I, I just got on with it. I did do a, a one week course at the beginning, uh, an intensive course, which I guess kind of kick started me. Um, but um, you know, for the first year I was here, I didn't ha- I, I didn't have a job, as I said, um, and I I just spent a lot of time with my wife, friends, and family, um, just picking it up. Uh, and then after a year or so, um, I started working for a small marketing agency, and that's that's I guess when 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 things started to uh, when I started to pick things up a lot more quickly. I guess when I joined the company, I could probably understand about fifty or sixty percent of, of most conversations, um, and with a couple of, within a couple of years, that went up to you know eighty ninety percent. And uh, I think in terms of you know fluency, in terms of being able to deal with more or less every everyday situation um, pretty well, then. Probably four or five years. Yeah, I would say. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's um, it's an impressive thing to do. Uh, it's not uh, it's not easy. Well, no, and uh, believe me, I, I, I'm the last person that I would have expected uh, to do it. I mean, I was the classic uh, English person. You know, speak speak loudly and more slowly in English, <laughs> and everybody will understand you. Uh, so, but but uh, no, I mean, once. You know, once once you're in a foreign country, then then I actually believe that it's you know it's beholden on you to 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 learn the language. Um, and I, I I would be personally quite embarrassed if if I'd come here and you know lived here for for this amount of time and and couldn't speak the language well. And um, I, I don't think that's really on. And I mean, you you know yourself, having lived in Spain, um, it, it's very important if you're going to live somewhere for any length of time to 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 speak the language. Yeah, you you reap the rewards uh, tenfold because the investment exactly. you've made, you get so much more out of being there and you can yeah. you can engage in every aspect of life. Absolutely. Otherwise I mean, you you end up being kind of an expat in an expat's bubble. Yeah, and exactly and that's that's actually something I deliberately avoided because exactly what most people come to a foreign country, English or American in particular, um, and, uh, I mean, there's always an Irish pub. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which is a city in the world you're the in. Magnet, the magnet for all the English speakers, yeah. Exactly, which, which is fine. You know, I did, I did also do a bit of that, but I, I deliberately didn't spend most of my time in those environments because I wanted to make sure that I, that I, that I picked up the language and, and didn't just 
make a beeline for all the other English speaking people. Um, so I think I think that's important. That's definitely you know, advice I would give anyone who, who is thinking of uh, doing something similar or moving to a foreign country. You need to you need to immerse yourself quickly. Um, it's difficult, but but as you say, the return is worth it. Sure. So and then c- coming back to Germany. So uh, Germany in in comparative terms to other European countries is, is a relatively new country in that it really just came together as a nation state in the 19th century, you know, whereas England and Spain have been around for maybe 500 years as, as, as states. And today Germany is a federal republic. You live in Munich in the federal state of, of Bavaria. So there's 16 federal states. And I think many people in the English-speaking world don't quite fully appreciate how different German regions are from each other. Different outlook, different traditions, even differences in the in the language. So you in, in Bavaria, what's the most characteristic thing of Bavaria that sets it apart, say, from places like Berlin or Hamburg or Frankfurt? Uh, um, well, the clue is in the name, of, um, in a way, because uh, this... this um, uh, Bundesland, as we call them, so like the, the, the regional um, federal uh, state, isn't it? Bundesland. Yes, the regional state is, is actually called uh, Freistadt by um, in in German, which means literally the free state of Bavaria. So, so there are plenty of people. Um, tends to be the older generation who, uh, who who don't really think of Bavaria as being part of Germany, <laughs> <laughs> and they they. Um, well, it was it was an independent country at, at a certain point in its history, was it not? Yeah, yeah, and and and, the, and that spirit of independence um, is is still very much alive and alive and well, and it, it, it's been bolstered in recent years, I think, by by the economic success. Um, and I mean, there, there's still a, a small lunatic fringe who who wants Bavaria to 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 secede from Germany and reinstate the Bavarian monarchy, um, but you know, that, that's a very very small minority. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I mean, if I was to characterise it. I think Bavarians, you know, they, they want to have a good time, but they also they're, they're very conservative. They actually want to a, a relatively quiet life. They want to be, they want to be left alone to get get on with their own business. Um, there, there's an there's an old money elite who are very heavily into the art. So if you're in in the centre of Munich, then you'll you know you'll see the Opera House, you'll see the museums. Um, but there's now also a commercial elite developed because of the economic success over the last 20 or 30 years who like to show off their wealth. So you'll see, a, you know, never in, if you're in the middle of Munich, you'll see a never ending stream of Bentleys and Ferraris and, uh, and you know, very high line uh, cars, lots of amazing clothes shops. Um, but, but at the end of the day, I think most Bavarians, um, you know, there's, a, there's an underlying feeling that everything's everything's going to be fine as long as you can sit down with a beer and, and a pretzel and, and have a good moan about everything. Um, you know, it's it's quite easy going. Um, whereas people in place, people in places like Hamburg, um, I think they see themselves as being culturally superior to the Bavarians. Um, mm-hmm. So there's definitely a bit of a, a snobbiness there. Um, but then again, you know, there are a lot of people from northern Germany in Bavaria, um, and I, I always I, I call it. The uh, the Sean Connery syndrome. Um, with Sean Connery, who likes to wax lyrical about how great Scotland is from his massive mansion in the Bahamas. Yeah, yeah. There you so, go. <laughs> so uh, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a strange mix to be honest. It's a strange mix. We've still got our agricultural um, heritage down here, but but in recent years, the tech business has become huge, and then we've also got the the big industrial um, players, BMW. Um, so yeah, it's it's becoming more commercial, um, but and more industrial. But it's um, yeah, it's 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 a lot more conservative and a lot less a lot less um, a lot less open in some ways than 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 say the old industrial heartland of the of the Rhine uh, area in the northwest. Yeah, interesting. And yeah. this this wealth of of Bavaria, so it's now the wealthiest uh, state in in Germany, um, but it hasn't always been the case. So maybe that's happened over the last twenty, thirty years or so. I think before that was rather poor and backward, maybe a bit of a laggard in comparison to the other regions. But a bit like Ireland, it's kind of transformed itself. Uh, into one of the wealthiest regions in Europe in, in a few short decades. So how did Bavaria actually do that? How did that happen? Well, um, I can't pretend I'm an expert on this, Patrick, but um, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, okay. I mean, I think it began uh, after the war. Munich and, and Bavaria was in, you know, was had a big American influence. Um, 
and and some of the large companies in Germany, it's like Siemens, started to move their headquarters down here. Um, and then I think uh, kind of in the 60s and 70s, the regional government made a lot of money available, um, you know, for, for companies to get started. Um, there's also a, a big advantage is, is, is that there's just a lot of smart people down here. There's, there's a lot of uh, very good universities um, who've kind of fueled um, the, the creation of new businesses over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, and then the, the growth of, of BMW in particular um, and the, the business, um, the, you know, the big, the big automotive manufacturers um, mm-hmm. who've established themselves as, as luxury, uh, luxury brands um, all helped as well. And, and to be honest, after that, I, I think, and then we had the, the there's kind of a, a mini recession in the in the mid to late '90s, I think. Um, and then in the early 2000s, I think I think more and more people and, and businesses started to realise that that the quality of life here is actually very good, um, and the location is very good, as I was talking about before. Um, and and since then, it's just it's just kind of taken on a life of its own, really. And the more people come, the more people start talking about it. And and um, yeah, pe- people want to come. Businesses want to come. People want to come. And you you only need to look at the kind of businesses who've, who've either moved in, like IBM has just arrived recently, um, or, or have re- rebuilt their their you know big big regional offices here. Microsoft has just fit, completed a big uh, a new big office in in Munich. Um, we've got Amazon, we've got um, Bosch, we've got Siemens, we've got big insurance companies. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's the momentum has just been building and building and building over the last thirty years. And uh, I think I think part of the antagonism between Bavaria and other parts of Germany is is partly due to that that kind of recent success. Because as as you say, forty years ago, it was exactly the opposite. Bavaria was taking money out out of the German economy, whereas now it's contributing um, it more than more than in many other regions. Yeah, and not only now does Munich have all of those businesses, it also has Hamish McKenzie Consultancy. So you <laughs> you set up your business there, and you provide specialist services uh, to tech companies, particularly with international business ambitions. So could you tell me a little bit about the type of services that you provide, kind of results that your clients achieve when they work with you? Uh, perhaps you could give us a couple of examples of that. Yeah, sure. So so one of the things I, I, I do, what I like to do most often is, is to help um, technology companies who perhaps have, have some kind of hardware product. Um, which is which is perhaps commoditizing, um, and you know profit margins are getting tight, tighter and tighter, and they want to move into software and solutions and services. And this is a very difficult transition to make because instead of um, you know shipping boxes of equipment at you know x thousand uh, euros per, per per unit or whatever. Um, they might need to start creating a business model which is more about um, software subscriptions, so much smaller amounts of money, but on a much longer term, more regular basis. And, and this is this requires completely different internal structures. It can it requires a different way of positioning themselves. It, it requires a different way of selling, um, and it's something that, that a lot of these kind of businesses struggle with. So so I help them in a in a range of areas from from marketing to sales enablement. Um, to to educating their their channels to market about the changes that the business wants to introduce, explaining to them why it makes sense, um, and yeah, really helping them make that transition. So that's that's one example. Um, and then I think the second main example is is as I was just mentioning the channel there. Um, so most software companies in particular send the sell or hardware as well for that matter sell their products through uh, indirect channels to market. So resellers, di- distributors. Um, and I've found over the years that, that a lot of those companies are not doing as much business through those channels as they could be. Um, so I, I help them optimize those channels by by making sure that they're right, they're working with the right kind of partners, maybe eliminating some of the wrong kind of partners that they might be working with, um, and generally sharpening up their their whole approach to market. Um, so yeah, th- those are the those are the two main areas I focus on. Very interesting. It's quite, it's quite an interesting niche. And quite a specialised area. So, how did you identify that opportunity, and what was your previous background, experience, and expertise? Yeah, well, I, I was afraid you were going to ask me this, and I, <laughs> I'd love to say that it was a, it was all part of a big master plan, but uh, it wasn't. Um, so, actually, in in England, but, but you know, twenty odd years ago, I started off in market res- research, and I, I was actually a telecoms analyst forecasting telecoms markets. Um, 
And uh, it was only when I moved to Germany that I moved into into technology marketing. Um, and then someone, um, and I did a lot of international marketing work for them. And then after a couple of years, their international work started to dry up. And then someone offered me um, the chance to do some, uh, some, some work as an independent consultant. So I did that. Um, and, and I just built it up over the years and I, I was working, you know, on various types of projects for the likes of HP, Oracle, uh, VMware. And over the years, I, I've moved, I've been moving more away from the, the, the pure marketing stuff, more and more into the strategic areas, like I was talking about, like, like positioning, like business development through the channel. So it's just been an, an evolution based on based on my preferences um, and based on um, you know the opportunities and the, the, the need that there is because as, as I said, technology companies struggle with transition. They struggle um, with um, getting their channels to market optimized. Um, and, and yeah, fortunately for me, um, it, it's, it's worked. And, and over the over the last ten years, I've managed to you know to grow the business. Uh, by uh, around fivefold, um, and I think I'm pretty confident that over the next ten years, there's the opportunity to do the, to do the same again. So, um, yeah, there, there's definitely still a lot of a lot of opportunity out there. Interesting. And and do you do today? Do you do most of your business with German companies looking to expand internationally, or with foreign companies looking to do business in Germany, or is it a bit of both? Um, well, actually, in a lot of cases, it's neither. It's, okay. uh, it's, it's actually international businesses that um, that happen to coordinate their regional business from Germany. Um, and so those kind of businesses um, really appreciate um, the, the ability to work with someone who, who can um, work very easily with an international workforce because these companies, quite a lot of the time, their internal corporate language is English, even if they're in Germany. So they, they need someone who can, who can communicate uh, and, and do business in English, but who can also, when it comes to actual meetings, presentations, um, you know, strategic work, can actually also communicate in local language with with local teams as well. Um, so that's one side. If, if it's not those, then it does tend to be German medium-sized technology companies who want to internationalize um, because they don't necessarily understand how. Um, English-speaking markets differ, how they need to communicate differently, how they need to set up differently, how the channel works differently uh, in those markets. Um, and to be honest, the other way around, foreign companies coming, coming wanting to get into Germany is not something um, I've really spent a lot of time on purely because of, of the complexity of doing business here for a foreign company. It's, it's very complex from a legal perspective. It's very complex from a tax perspective. Um, and and this, is, you know, this is outside of my, my area of expertise, to be honest. And you're, uh, it's, yeah, it's something I could look at in the future, but it's not a focus at the moment. So what, what is your ambition for the future for the business? Where, where do you plan to take it in the coming years? Well, as I said, I mean, I, th I think there's, there's a lot of opportun opportunity in, in the areas that I'm already working on. Um, the channel, channels to market, as I was talking about before, um, they're changing. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of software business in particular is, not, is now done in the cloud, obviously. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the channels to market are disappearing it just means that they're they're yeah they're changing and becoming different um so there's a lot of scope for for specializing in that area so i'd like to just carry on doing that broaden more out into the into the cloud area um, and then perhaps perhaps um help organizations a bit more deeply with their with their internal organizational challenges so um it's one thing to to kind of advise them on on the direction they should be taking but it's another thing to actually make it make it happen um, and that's often where a lot of these projects can come unstuck um, so I'm, I'm getting more and more into that as time goes on and I guess one other area I would like to perhaps um, start helping executives on a one-to-one -one basis as well mm -hmm. uh, like yourself Patrick I, I spend a lot of time um, you know investing in, in my own development uh, and I know how that's helped me from a coaching and mentoring perspective so um, that's it would be nice to be able to pass on some of that to, to other people in a few years time I don't think I'm quite ready for it yet but uh, but certainly something I'd look, I'd look to do in the future challenge for the future so as you know we have a large uh, tech sector here so for listeners in the tech sector who'd like to learn more about you and your business and your services how can they uh, and how they can benefit from working with you how, c how can they find out more about you website email so on yeah so that's that's very simple um, well the spelling 
Facebook, as I said. Uh, the, the website is uh, hamishmackenzie.com. And that's Mackenzie. Just... The difference with your Mackenzie, you've got M-A-C, isn't that right, instead of M-C? Exactly. So it's H-A-M-I-S-H-M-A-C-K-E-N-Z-I-E.com. Uh, or else you can just look me up, look me up in, on LinkedIn. That's the other place I, I hang out uh, a lot. And um, yeah, there's, I think pretty sure there's only one Hamish Mackenzie in Munich. Okay. So if you put those details into LinkedIn, you're pretty, pretty certain to find me. You know, Hamish, I'm going to have to get you back on here. So many more questions uh, for you, but unfortunately the clock is against us. So thanks so much, Hamish, for being with us uh, today. It's been really fascinating to get your perspective uh, as an expat living in continental Europe. Look forward to speaking to you again. And thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Hamish. Yeah, my pleasure, Patrick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.